trust that everybody just had one of those nights where you woke up, oh, just fresh and rested. It's, it's camp, you know, it's camp. There's a quality of sleep that can be expected at camp. I, uh, I live in the vicinity here, so I won't, <clears throat> I won't brag about sleeping in my bed last night, but um, I also have two kids under the age of six, so rest, rest assured, I did, not, I did not have better sleep than you. So we have a big kind of stretch of time that is really important this morning. Um, we're going to break into some groups in a little bit. Uh, because the training that we're going to have for parents is a little different than the training we want our students to have. I do want to point out, if you are a returning Aspire Academy student, would you raise your hand really quick, nice and high. So, if okay, keep them in the air, just like you don't care. Keep them up there, and then if you are a new student, look around at these students that are returning, okay? The reason, okay, you can now put your hands down. The reason I want you guys to identify yourselves is because when we, when we break into our student groups, I have a sense that the teachers that are leading out during that time are going to rely on you to help them when they ask you to, when they ask you to, that's important, okay, when they ask you to, to help out, maybe go get someone uh, signed in, show them how to join their class, that, that kind of thing. Because um, you are going to be experts too, but you know, <clears throat> I would wait until you're asked to help, you know, before you decide to do that. Um, so, and then uh, we're going to have some students go over, all the students actually go over into the cafeteria and divide into some groups over there, and the parents will stay in here for some really exciting training with me. Um, so, I mean, honestly, so exciting. Um, we are going to probably take a little break because we have a stretch of time dedicated this morning from about 10 o'clock until noon, and then you'll have a little break before we have before we eat again. It's camp, so we eat just all the time. That's great. Um, and um, the parents actually, I don't plan on, on keeping you guys busy all the way till, till noon, so if you want to head over and, and see if you can be of assistance potentially over with your students, that's fine. I will warn you that Sometimes your idea of assistance is not all, doesn't always read that way to the teacher. So maybe ask if you can be of assistance, and if not, you can maybe go take a nap or something. But, but parents, I won't keep you until, until noon. What we're doing is a little less rigorous than what the kids are going to have to do with the unboxing of their devices, learning how to set it up, make sure we can hit the ground running on Monday morning, ready for school. But um, here's what I'd like to do. Let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to go through a few more details. I'd like to sing our theme song together, and then we will divide into those groups and, and conquer the morning. Um, Mr. Alex, did you get the... Okay, fantastic. We don't need it yet. Would you bow your heads with me as we invite the Lord to be with us here and guide as we, as we go into our morning program? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us, for waking us up this morning, for giving us a beautiful day promised to us again here in northern Michigan. Lord, I'm reminded that we, we often think about the big and important things that you do for us, those profound um, acts of generosity where you intervene in, in a significant way, and we feel great, Lord, but, but often it's the little things that add up through the day that bring us joy that we sometimes forget to be grateful for. And this morning, I'm grateful for the cool air in here. I'm grateful for the sunshine outside. I'm grateful for good friends, for students and families here. Lord, we want to just invite your Holy Spirit to bless us now for these next uh, few moments that we spend together doing some important training and just guide us as we prepare ourselves not only for this moment here in training but for the rest of the school year. We pray these things, Lord, in your name. So I've got some, uh, some things here that I want to go over with you. Um, Alex, I don't know if you can, I have them in front of me here, but. So the unbox, to be honest, I don't know, are the, are the computers actually already out of boxes, you guys? 
Some of them, some of them not. You may have one that's not in a box. I'm sorry, if it's not in a box, that's okay. You just don't have to unbox it. Um, but we're gonna go through the process of setting it up, making sure that you get logged in, making sure everything works, because of course on Monday morning, we're remote, and helping you get things done will still be a possibility, but it won't be as, <laughs> it won't be as easy to accomplish. So we're gonna try to take care of that as much as possible as we can right now. We do have about 19 students that are not here. And so you have to understand that helping them get set up on that morning is gonna be where a lot of our time and energy is gonna go. So we really wanna make sure that when you walk out of here um, uh, tomorrow with your device in hand that you're ready to plug and play and have a great first day of school um, on Monday morning, okay? So we're gonna make sure that that all is taken care of. So the first through eighth graders, if you're in first through eighth grade, raise your hand. Not, not in all of those grades, but if you're in either first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, raise your hand. So you guys who have your hands up in the air, uh, when, when I dismiss you, you're gonna go through the lobby and you're gonna take a seat in the cafeteria, but just right when you go through the door. You know where the grapes and the yogurt and the big blue water jugs were at the far end of the cafeteria? You're gonna sit on, you're gonna sit on that side of the cafeteria, okay? Everyone else in high school Giada, do you have a question or you just want, okay, cool. <clears throat> um, everyone else in high school is gonna, is gonna scamper all the way down to the far end of the cafeteria. And I don't know what scampering looks like. I do, in, what's that? A scamper? It's sort of a, a mousy activity, isn't it? Anyway, some of you will indeed, thank you, Christian, well done. I'm not sure if it's a scamper, but we'll go with it. Okay. We'll talk about that later. So we'll, um, yeah, so the high school students will head on down to the far side of the cafeteria and you'll meet with your crew there. Uh, your experience and interaction with the device is a little bit different. We just don't want everyone all in one place too, okay? So we're gonna be going through a handful of things as well there, how to turn in your assignments, use your, use your um, camera on your device, on your Chromebook as a scanner. Um, to turn in work that you may be working on in your, just on a piece of paper or a consumable resource. Um, some of you may be able to get logged in and set up to Jupyter. Um, if you're not able to do that because of the emails associated with your accounts, I'm talking just to students now. Every parent that enrolled their student has, you provided me with an email that through Jupyter, okay? The students may be a little bit different. If you don't, if you're not set up yet, if you're a new student, um, then we can still kind of show you what the process looks like. And I'll get into that um, with the parents and I'll let also the teachers talk to you about why it's gonna be so important for you to know how to log into Jupiter Education. Um, because last year you'll know that we did most of our, or really all of our significant communication about your grades and stuff like that, that was all done through Google Classroom, okay? We're not doing that this year. Everything is gonna be just directly through Jupiter. It will be the, the, the portal where parents and students and everyone and teachers are able to communicate and we'll be able to get information out quickly and accurately. The challenge was this, in a nutshell. The grading parameters that existed in Google Classroom, which is where all the students work, will be worked, you know, worked on, where you'll submit it, where your teachers will get back to you. You can, you can enter grades in Google Classroom, but the parameters and, and the way that the grade is arrived at is a little different and unique, and that created a, a lot of extra work when students were importing those grades back over to Jupiter. So rather than worrying about that, or any of the discrepancies that might end up existing between Jupiter and, and Google Classroom, everything is gonna be just through Jupiter. We'll get into the details of that as well. Um, map testing, I'm gonna talk to parents about this as well, but um, map testing is a standardized test, so much fun, um, that is actually given across many or most educational institutions across, the, uh, across America, not just within the church, okay? The reason this is such a valuable metric now moving forward is it allows us to understand and see how Seventh-day Adventist students uh, or students in Seventh-day Adventist schools are measuring up in terms of their success to students who are enrolled in schools across America. The other great thing about it, and students may feel differently about this, 
is that the test is given three times through the year instead of just one time. If any of you have been in Adventist education long enough, you'll know that we used to do just the Iowa tests of basic skills. Did anyone ever have to take any of the Iowa tests? Mr. Canada did? Indeed, okay. <laughs> So what was it? Five years, ago, uh, five years ago, the NAD, the North American Division, said, you know what, we're done with this single test a year. Because, of course, that was given in September, right at the beginning of the school year. It was given once. And it was really a valuable metric or measurement of what students had retained over the course of the summer, which, if you're like me, was not a lot. <laughs> well, I mean, it was probably not as much as it should have been. And then, of course, these little Scantron bubble Sheets went off to be graded, and teachers were lucky if they had them back by Thanksgiving, and then you were lucky to have uh, them available to you at the second uh, parent-teacher conference, and by, by then you were really saying to a parent, hey, so this is how your kid did at the end of last year in terms of what they knew and understood. Now the MAP tests are given three times a year. We can track growth. Your kid picks up, your child picks up right where they left off in the content areas they're being tested on in the previous year, and it becomes this entire picture of the student's growth through their experience in, uh, being enrolled in Seventh-day Adventist school. It also turns into this really valuable resource that parents and teachers can look at to understand how they can help kids fill in the gaps, or how they can continue to push students to be successful in areas where they're really uh, achieving really high. So we're going to have our students also practice signing in to that map uh, test screen because of course those are proctored remotely because you guys are going to be in your homes. Um, and we want to make sure that, that goes smoothly and I want to talk to parents specifically about things you can do um, to help your students do well or as, as, as well as they can do taking those tests at home. It doesn't involve doing the test for them. No one would do that here, I know that, and I'm not joking, I know that wouldn't be seen, but <clears throat> it's really interesting. The way that the, the tests are administered can collect a lot of interesting data. Um, it will actually pause tests for your students if they're answering too quickly. So you have this built-in AI that says, okay, so this, this question is, 15 sentences long, it should take on average X number of minutes or seconds to read it. You shouldn't be answering before that amount of time has passed. And if students do that too quickly, their screen pauses. The proctor gets a, a warning that says, hey, Ben's test has been paused because he's guessing rapidly. Um, the other thing it can identify is, is sharp increases in performance or sharp decreases in performance. And we usually get a warning that says, hey, this student very likely received additional help during the test. Um, because if they score really high and then really low, that usually means that, that what it usually doesn't mean is that they lost that much information. It usually means they had a lot of help in the first piece of that. So let's avoid having those awkward conversations. But anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. And you'll be going through some of this um, other fun stuff on the list here as well. So that's kind of the, the front-loaded side of things. Uh, one thing I do want to chat with you, and this can be an ongoing conversation, I have to take some responsibility for a little oopsie that I've tried to make right. And I understand it won't be a perfect uh, solution to everybody. But please work with, with me on this. Several of you had indicated certain spots for a horseback ride this afternoon, and several of you guys got those. Um, what I failed to communicate to my staff is that some of those tickets were specifically for people who had requested certain times to go, and they didn't get handed out in the correct order. Again, that was completely my fault. If you want to be frustrated with anyone, you can come and take that out on me. What that means is that we ended up really handing out tickets for horseback riding to some people who didn't have them reserved, while other people who did have them reserved um, didn't get them. So what I've actually done is I've, I've organized very kindly with the camp um, an opportunity to do two horseback riding um, sessions tomorrow as well. If you can talk with me um, later on about how we can accommodate you, those would be specifically for families who had tickets to go but did not get them. And here's the other piece of the puzzle too. 
once those tickets go out, it becomes quite a challenge to try to pull them back in and redo them. Just like, hey, give me your tickets back, just kidding. Um, so there may be some families that are not able to go tomorrow that were, that were able, I'm sorry, that are able to, well, let me start over again. There may be some families that are not able to go tomorrow um, that might want to switch with you if you are and you have tickets, okay? So maybe we'll have, when the parents are all together, we can engage in a little conversation to make sure that everyone who wants to go horseback riding is able to do it. And you know what, I would really appreciate <clears throat> you helping me, all of us helping me fix the issue that I created by not, by not really effectively communicating to my faculty, who were being very helpful in handing out tickets, that there was actually a right and wrong way to do that. So my apologies, my hope is that between the tickets we handed out and the two horseback riding slots that are available tomorrow, anyone who wants to go horseback riding will be able to do it. That's my hope and my prayer. Okay. I would love to, to sing our theme song. I don't know if we're gonna be able to do it tonight. I, I don't wanna piggyback on um, Matt and Josie's music, and I especially don't wanna do it in such close proximity to the amazing ministry they're gonna be doing with music because that's just not something I'd like to do. They're so incredible, you guys. I don't know if you've been blessed by their music before, but they're looking forward to being here. So this may be the last opportunity we have to sing it today, so I'd like to invite you guys to stand as we sing our theme song. There's a red light. I, don't, I feel like red lights are not usually a sign of things properly working, right? We'll make it work here. Praise the Lord for Alex. me to lean on you in all I do. Teach me your way. When the place I'm in is where I've been and not your way. Teach me your way. I have no reason, no When there's trials in the past not smooth, I will walk in your truth. I'll get it wrong and I'll stand accused. I won't be alone with nothing to lose. No matter where I'm at, it's true. No matter how hard it I will walk in your truth. Teach me your way, oh Lord. Teach me your way. Unite my heart, oh Lord, to fear your name. Teach me a When the place I've been is 
is where I've been and not your way. Teach me your way. I have no reason, no excuse. It is in easy, but I have to choose. When the trials and the path's not smooth, I will walk in. I'll get it wrong and I'll stand accused. I won't be alone with nothing to lose. No matter where I'm at, it's true. No matter how hard it gets, I will walk in your truth. Amen. You guys may be seated. So, I want to make sure my, my staff is ready for, for everyone to depart. They're not here to say yes or no. So you guys remember, if you're in first through eighth grade, we're in a, we'll just, I think that group may be a little bigger. But if you're in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth grade. Have you guys quietly stand up? First through eighth grade? I'm going to have you guys walk through the lobby and take a seat on the very close end here of the cafeteria. And parents, you get, you get to stay back here. All right, when that's done, I actually should have dismissed the high school kids first. You live and you learn. You guys are doing great. I love all the Aspire Academy swag I see you guys have. That's awesome. All right. High school kids, it looks like we're at a safe place here. You guys can head down to the far end of the cafeteria and meet up with your crew. Very good. And now there's very few people in here. <clears throat> All the parents are like, finally. The camp experience I was waiting for. That's great. wait for everyone to leave because it's top secret stuff is going on in here. So I'd probably, I'll do this. Okay. This gooseneck is probably helpful in a lot of situations. It's super loud though. All right, let me have a word of prayer with you guys before we get started. Um, I really hope that we'll be wrapped up here by around 11 o'clock. And then, <laughs> I don't want to be in trouble with my faculty. <clears throat> your, if you sense that your presence is supportive and helpful over there, then you're welcome to stay. Uh, sometimes when parents um, are in the presence of their kids, when they're around their teachers, there's this weird thing that happens with a division of like who's in charge. Um, so just read the room over there. Believe it or not, one of the most interesting statements I've had over and over from parents through my years of teaching when I was en enrolling kids for the first time is a parent would say, man, good luck with them. Good luck. And I'm always like, hey, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Because they weren't really wishing me luck. <laughs> They were saying, you're going to have your hands full. Um, but I've never had a parent say that to me that I didn't end up really loving um, as a part of my school or one of my uh, students. And the truth is that teachers and parent, uh, sorry, teachers and students have um, a relationship, a working relationship, 
that shouldn't exist between you and your children. Um, ours is professional, and many times we enjoy the ability to require compliance and get it in ways that you simply you just don't. I'm not saying you don't have the skills. I'm just saying the relationship isn't, isn't like that. So anyway, just be aware of that. You, you're, the caveat is you're free to go in and see what's going on there, but I also have um, one of the best group of teachers at any school in the Michigan Conference. I know that I'm supposed to say that, <clears throat> but it is true. And they're capable and will do a good job um, hanging out with and working with your kids. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, as we spend the next few minutes here um, just discussing the ways that parents can successfully help their students do well um, in school, Lord, specifically even perform well in the unique environment that Aspire Academy requires, I just want to ask that your Holy Spirit would provide for us a level of understanding that will really facilitate us launching into a year um, that's going to be successful. Lord, we know that there will be challenges because we are on this earth, and that is part of the reality that we have to deal with every day. But Lord, we know that as we serve you and as we uh, pursue the objective of doing what is best for these students, both teachers and parents, um, that we can be assured that as we follow your will, um, we can be assured that we are doing things that are pleasing in your sight. So Lord, we thank you in advance for the time we're spending here together, uh, that it would be productive when we pray these things in your name, amen. So the big, the big piece, and if you are, if you're new to Aspire Academy, or even if this is just serving as a reminder for you, <laughs> um, if you're a returning parent, and I'm, I alluded to this, I alluded to this yesterday, but a really, really important piece of the success of this program is predicated on, on you guys providing a fixed learning environment for your students. Now, what I mean by that is uh, a place that your students go to every day where a certain set of um, assumptions exist about that, that space, right? Like, um, there's resources there that they need to be successful in school. They have things like markers, crayons, watercolors, maybe not water. That's always dangerous. Our Chromebooks are waterproof. <clears throat> that doesn't mean your kids should test that. Um, don't tell them. We usually don't tell them that because like waterproof, huh? <laughs> let's see how waterproof it is, right? It's like, really? Let's try that out. But um, there's really not a lot of value in talking about the far end of the, the spectrum on that. But I will tell you that last year, I did, I did dismiss people from our program who were wonderful children and great kids. But I dismissed them because it wasn't really the right fit. The parents never, it didn't click with them. These kids were showing up, God bless them, you know, laying down in bed and stuff like that. So again, the privilege of working from home, there's tons of privileges there. There's tons of privileges there. But you really have to ap approach this experience like your kids are in school. Because it is live and it is synchronous. The lessons are designed in a way for your kids to have questions. And the teachers are there to answer those questions. So that's, a, that's an important you know, piece of it. Now, can you have fixed learning environments around your home, potentially, where they know they can go to? Yeah, absolutely. And if you live in an environment where you're a little more transient and you're moving around from place to place, Look, that's fine too. We've successfully served families that do that too. But the idea is that during the hours of direct instruction with your kids, they need to be in an area where they are capable of working live with their teachers, okay? Asking questions, they need to be prepared to get answers. And if they're not in an environment that is denoted to those types of things happening, it's not that they won't be successful, it's just that we have discovered that there's a lot of challenges associated with that. The other, the other thing that happens though sometimes is, is that this environment of learning from home sometimes 
provides or creates this idea that, oh, um, I will get my work done on Friday, right? Because we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in school. We don't have school on Friday, which is great. But sometimes something happens. This belief starts to exist that I can disengage a little bit through the week and just get caught up on Friday. Um, the challenge with that is that that is not the scope and sequence of the lesson. And it is also very unlikely that a student will not work during the week and get everything done that they need to get done on Friday because there's an issue with this. It's a very fundamental issue, okay? If one of our teachers chooses, notice that I said choose, chooses to work with your student on Friday, that is based on their own volition, okay? So if your student waits until Friday to do all their work and then is upset because the teacher is not able to tutor them one-on-one -on, -one on Friday, you can call me and I will tell you that that teacher is under no obligation to tutor your child on Friday, <laughs> okay? The idea is that they're to show up every day and be immersed in the learning experience with their teacher because honestly, when a lesson is presented, in science, social studies, whatever it might be, writing, language arts, and there's a question, the most relevant time to deal with the question is in the midst of them having to pursue the requirements of finishing the assignment, okay? Here's the other piece of the puzzle. We don't want our kids having homework. We don't even want our kids working on Friday, which is maybe a crazy new concept, but in truth, Aspire's been doing this for two years already. The Michigan Conference has just moved now to allow schools across the conference to only be in school, I shouldn't say only, to be in school rigorously for four days a week, okay? And I won't get into all of that with you, but I, there's something like 50 to 60% of the schools across Michigan now are all doing four day a week or some iteration or version of a shortened day on Friday. Lots of reasons for that. Not gonna get into that right now, but the point is, especially with students who are learning on devices, right? That Friday off from the inception of what we were doing with Aspire was based on the idea that there was a requirement for our students to be engaged online, interacting with their teachers, and when Friday showed up, we wanted that to be a day where they were not looking at a glowing rectangle for the lack of a better way of putting it. It's interesting, our life is really full of a lot of glowing rectangles when you think about it. It's not good, right? Vertical ones, TVs, it's, it's, it's a reality of things. And it's an unavoidable aspect of the Aspire Academy program, but work hard during the week. We have breaks during the day that I've talked to my faculty about that are really deviceless breaks this year. We're really moving towards really pushing that. That lunchtime, that 45 minute lunch break, by the way, that your students get from 12 to 12.45, in the absence of a really good reason to be online during that time, like as in working on something for school, we really want those to be deviceless breaks. Now if a student reaches out and says, hey, I." I have this project I'm trying to finish or whatever. Me and a student want to work together. Can we do that over break if you're kind of monitoring what's going on? Whatever, that's fine. That's an exception to the rule, right? And there may be even times when there's a few days in a row where students have to work. But you have to understand, breaks are important. The Lord knew that when he created the world and he gave us a break. Um, and you know, how many of you, get doing, had, did any of you guys work from home over COVID and you just, and now your, your life is now working from home? Okay, so there's a fun, it's really, really important when you work at home to create intentional times where you are away from your workspace so you can reset. So there's a morning break too for our lower grade students from 10, uh, oh goodness, 1040 to, no, sorry, yeah, 1040 to 1110. Those we want to be deviceless breaks. We want them away from their devices. We want them running around. Often I would tell my kids, you know, I don't know if you ever heard them say this, but Mrs. Ork said to go chase squirrels. So they had to go chase squirrels, and it was a joke, but several of them came back and told me that in fact they had almost caught one. <laughs> and for those kids, I thought to myself, I am not surprised. 
<clears throat> yep, that sounds like it makes sense. Um, <laughs> uh, you get the point, okay? We want to get away from this idea that you sit down at 8.30 and you get locked into deer in the headlights staring at <laughs> your device. It is necessary for synchronous live interaction with teachers, but beyond that, we're trying to limit it as much as possible. Oh, by the way, there is now a lot of, this is the danger of quoting research is, is that if you don't have the source, <laughs> it loses some of its credibility. Um, but we all know and understand that there is some risks or concerns associated with people being on devices. But as it turns out, the real negative um, experience that comes out of that is passive involvement. So that means we're talking about our brain waves like going into like the brain dead state, you know, which is why all of us, or not all of us, I shouldn't speak for everyone, why some of us at the end of a long day like to sit down and, and watch a show because your brain just turns off. So that's not a good sustained place to be in in your life, but that is a very different experience than uh, what you will discover is happening with your students in terms of the interaction they're having with their classmates, the interaction they're having with their, with their teachers, that back and forth. Um, so I, I wanna encourage you a little bit. The data on that seems to suggest that actually a live and dynamic interaction is not the same as sitting you know, catatonic staring at a screen. That experience is not something at all that we're trying to replicate. Um, and we would have a harder, a very difficult time justifying the merits of that if that's what we were, if that's what we were doing. So help us out. If during those breaks you see your kids hanging around, because there's some kids that I, uh, just anecdotally, we started locking screens during these breaks. <laughs> and a parent came to me and said, you know, my, my son stares at the lock screen during break. And I said, <coughs> I said, you know, that sounds like a you problem, you know, politely, you know, <laughs> it's, so, it's so hard to navigate around that one. I'm like, I'm not sure what you want me to do about that. I feel like locking the screen was kind of like my job. Like that, I did my part. If you choose to let your child stare at a, your screen has been locked screen for 30 minutes, then that is an interesting choice. So part of, part of, no. It's beautiful. It's, you know, I love working with parents. Um, I do. I know I do. I do. That, that literally, I mean that. Um, you know, in education, l let me give you a little cue into this. So education is one of those unique fields of study where we have our job and then we have our clients. And those are two different things. Our job is dealing with kids, right? That's why people went into education. That's why teachers did it. Surprisingly, it's not for the house in the Hamptons, right? We went into it because we love interacting with kids. We love making an impact. We love making a change. We like the idea of being involved with something that's bigger than who we are. And that's a rewarding part of it. Um, but it's unique because that's our job, but our clients are not our job. Our clients are our parents. So just remember that when you're interacting with teachers this year, that we have 40 hours a week. Well, you know what I mean. We have our job, which we love during the week, and then we have our clients, which we love most of the time. I always remember, and I'm a parent too, and it's tough sometimes sitting in a parent-teacher conference, but always remember that the teachers that work with your kids are professionals that love and care about your kids and have the benefit of seeing and understanding them in an objective way. They're Seventh-day Adventist teachers that God's placed in your life. If they have something to share with you that challenges some assumptions that you have about your kids, would you be open to listening and hearing what that teacher has to share with you? We love your kids. We do. We have the, priv the privilege and benefit of seeing them from a different perspective than you do. But we're in this. We're in this together. So... A little bit of a ramble there on a fixed learning environment, but it all goes hand in hand. Think about ways that you can provide an environment for your student that denotes a readiness for learning, okay? Part of that probably also involves what they're wearing. Now, I'll tell you, <laughs> I will not 
and I will not ask my teachers to get into enforcing uh, dress code unless it becomes a serious issue, okay? But what I will tell you anecdotally is that there is an important level of um, consideration that should be given to what a student does in the morning when they get up and get ready for school, <laughs> right? Do they show up with their PJs on? I mean, maybe on the bottom, right? I mean, that's the, that's the running joke with our faculty. We always say we're professional from the middle up. Bottom down, I mean, I had, a, I remember I, I did wear my Christmas pajama bottoms once to school. I had a button down and a tie on, and I did do like a reveal to the camera. They were like candy cane striped, super comfy, but definitely probably in April, in April. And I remember I heard from a parent later whose child shared with them the amount of duress that caused them. Not because I was wearing pajamas, but because they were out of season pajamas. <laughs> so I had to apologize to that student and let them know that I would do better. I would do better at making sure my comfy bottoms were seasonally appropriate. So yeah, his takeaway is Mr. Zork, those are Christmas pajamas. I'm like, party foul, my bad. I'll try to get some spring jammies on next. The, the idea is this, you know this, we all know this, that there's something about being dressed and ready to go for the day that also impacts the quality of the work your child's gonna be able to produce. So be thoughtful about that. Big picture is this, when you're learning from home but expected to be engaged in professional behavior, what you have to do is be intentional, right? About not overindulging <laughs> into all the benefits and privileges that you have with learning that comes along with learning from home, right? Is it comfortable? Yes. Can you roll out of bed at 8:35 and make it to school on time? Yes. That doesn't mean you should. Okay. Um, you need to be thinking and be thoughtful of all these types of things, and think about really how you can set your kids up to be successful. Um, believe it or not, I've had to have some conversations, no one in here, of course, and I do mean that truly. I've had to call some parents and remind them that the TV that is visible um, in the background of their child while they're learning is probably not the best idea for school. Okay, so I'll just kind of share that with you right now. Um, talking with your kids during school time is also a big distraction for teachers. I, re I remember I was doing a lesson that was in Bible and I was just really bringing home the final thought. And some kid, I saw they were turned away and they were just engaged in a really important conversation with their parent. Um, and you know, how do you navigate around that? Well, I'm, that's fun, because the parent's in there talking to their kid. But I think that it's fair for you to assume that any time during live instruction time in a class, if you would give priority to making sure that your student is in a place um, where they're able to break away and not necessarily trusting that, that they are, in a, if they tell you that they're, oh yeah, no, we're good, we can talk. So just, I, I don't know if there's an easy answer for that, but don't, but don't, <laughs> would you walk, you know, would, would you, sometimes I ask these rhetorical questions and I recognize it's a false equivalency. This is not a perfect apples to apples comparison, but you wouldn't walk into your child's classroom and start talking to them, right? You would go through a certain set of protocols to make sure that you, that you entered in a way that was appropriate, that you weren't inter interrupting the teacher, that you did it in an appropriate time. But on our schedule, if you see that there's class time scheduled, you could assume that they're probably engaged in something live and important, either with their teacher or their classmates. And those breaks, you know, you'll notice that our schedule ends and starts right away. We don't have the breaks in between, but those are great times to check in. Are there emergencies? Are there things that need to be taken care of? Absolutely. But here's what happens. In a classroom, in a physical brick and mortar setting, teachers become obsessed with, with um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Obsessed with the flow of their day. Right, because management is like 90% of the experience of a physical brick and mortar classroom. How are you managing your students? If you aren't managing their behavior or managing their on-task behavior, then anything you have planned for them to learn doesn't matter. And so if that's interrupted constantly and we're in a, we are really incapable of making you stop talking to your kids, right? We, we don't, it's really, it's, it really takes a lot of the, the, the momentum out of what we're trying to do. So will there be times that you have to pop in and get your kids' attention? Absolutely. Fire alarms going off in the house, right? I mean, there's, that, that happened. I mean, that happened to me when I was teaching. And I'm like, excuse me, I need to go. 
kind of like <laughs> nice leopard pants, Mr. Zork. I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. I don't have leopard pants. Um, they were. I mean, leopard's always in season. That's the great thing about leopard. Thank you, man. It's true. Um, <clears throat> um, so, where was I? Yeah. You are free to interact with and get your kid's attention and talk to them if it's, if it's necessary. But just understand, always weigh that against the impact it could have in the flow of what's going on in their classroom. Okay? It's live. It's synchronous. It's dynamic. The kid may be talking with a teacher at that point. I mean, I've literally been talking to a kid, and they go, Mrs. Ork, wait. Boop. No. Texting their parent. Okay. Um, all of our teachers have phones. You can call or text. Just be aware if it's during an instruction time, you can call, but they're not going to pick up. If you text them and say, hey, there's an emergency, they may see that and be able to connect with you. Okay. So you can always text. All the numbers that are going to be listed online also receive texts. So if you're like, hey, um, I gotta t I'm sorry, he's got a whatever, there's something going on, we gotta go. Texting is a great way to communicate that. Because even if they don't get it, and they're just, your kid, they're suddenly gone, they'll have, oh, okay, they'll have some connection or context for what's going on. All right, how many of you, well, you don't have to raise your hand. Several of you will have kids that are learning at home in one location. So in one home, different grades, okay? If they're in the same room together, that's okay. Just understand what that does. A little bit like just be prepared for the reality of what that can look like um, there are some technology things that you need to be aware of if you have kids that are learning in the same room together they really should have like the old school call center you know thank you for calling AT&T type thing like the headphones with the some of them have the little the, the string that has the mic on them those work fine most of them are like, you can get them for 15 to 20 bucks on Amazon. They work really, they work really well. Obviously, the benefit of that is that if they unmute themselves to talk, um, they don't get feedback from their sibling who is talking in another class, right? And then that feedback loop happens and all that kind of good stuff. If you do get headphones, though, they have to have a mic on them. <laughs> the IT guy over here is laughing. So here's what happened. We had one family get headphones, and they were, it took us about uh, three weeks of troubleshooting to, to figure out why the mic wasn't working when they had their headphones plugged in. <coughs> oh, there's no mic on the headphones. So. And it's the headphone jack, so it bypassed the microphone. Anyway, it was not my proudest hour. Yeah, I'm like, wait a minute, is that, does that have a mic on it? No. Well, there you go. Interestingly enough, things without mics don't work to pick up sound. Now you know, that was a little bonus, uh, little bonus information. Um, but probably having them separated a little bit is not a bad idea. We had one parent, like, they kept a, a refrigerator box. They did cut off most of the sides. It wasn't just like <laughs> crawl into your den of education. Um, but little things like that are very helpful. We had some kids at a your den of education. That's a new hashtag that can hopefully make it. Aspire Academy, hashtag den of education. Um, we, had, uh, we have a couple satellite school locations, and obviously we have lots of kids in one location. Uh, we had, I think, in one location, uh, a church member actually built little dividers. Fantastic idea. A lot of, it really reduces, you know, the poking. <laughs> and all that kind of good stuff. Um, several, some of you may be learning in pods. So you live in a community where there's several Aspire Academy kids. Those headphones, just thinking about keeping separation and stuff like that during um, tests and stuff like that is important too. <clears throat> anyway, just some unique things to consider that may not come to the forefront as you are thinking about what really impacts the experience of your child at Aspire. And of course, understand that our evaluation of the quality of the experience is very specific. And it may be divergent from what you perceive are the benefits of learning from home. And if that happens, we're gonna have to have a productive conversation about how we can meet in the middle. The metrics that an Aspire Academy teacher is using to evaluate 
the quality of the program and the experience is, are our students learning? It's very simple. Are our students learning? If they can do that while enjoying maybe some of the benefits that you will certainly experience by having your kids at home, some of you actually are making sacrifices as well to have your kids learn from home, and that's, that's a consideration too. But some of those benefits of being right there and ready to go, the comforts of home, again, all of those are wonderful things, but we just have to be cautious that we're aware of how they may interact with our objective for your children, which is that they are learning, okay? That they're engaged and that they're meeting that expectation. A question we get sometimes from parents is, hey, um, so-and-so we missed three or four days, can we get the lessons? Well, right now, I'm not saying this isn't in the future for Aspire Academy, but right now the answer to that is we'll do our best, okay? But our school is designed in the same way, uh, the type of instruction is designed in the same way that your kids would be getting instruction if they were in a physical brick and mortar school. So could you get those lessons from a teacher? Yeah, you could. Would they necessarily be recorded? I mean, maybe if they're doing that, um, some of our teachers do record some lessons. And always, if you're going to be gone, knowing in advance, my, my preference was always to have, if kids are going to be gone, to have them work ahead. Right? Because that whole, give me the work, I'll do it on vacation thing, right? <laughs> doesn't happen. And so I've talked with my faculty. They're, they're, we're all in one accord there. If you can communicate being gone ahead of time, you can get help ahead of time, you can get it done ahead of time, and then enjoy the time that you have off. Um, families at Aspire sometimes choose Aspire because they are, uh, they move around sometimes, they, uh, they can't be in a fixed location, but they still want their kids to have Seventh-day Adventist education. That's great, we wanna be accommodating of those, of those families, but just understand that philosophically Aspire is in a position where we're offering something unique in the world of online learning, okay? We're not asynchronous, you're not gonna get a packet in the mail and say, check in with me in a month, right? Um, the, the Adventist Church has a great program that does that already, um, and we're, we're a different experience. So if you know you're going to be traveling, if you know you're going to be offline, try to communicate with that uh, with ahead of time so that we can get kids worked ahead. That's always the preference, that they're worked ahead. Here's another piece of information that I need to be really explicit and, and just forthright and honest with you about. Uh, last year I sent out a handful of truancy letters to parents which served as a real surprise to some people. And I know that because they responded by saying, um, but you're an online school. And I said, yes, our handbook though says that we expect timely, <laughs> daily, and the word in there is actually sustained attendance, um, and our teachers do take attendance every day, multiple times through the day, like a half day doesn't count type thing, unless it's been communicated with us. Um, and just so a little window into the world of education, grade reports, and especially, um, and I know there's teachers in here who may have their own anecdotes about the legality of a, an attendance document. That is a legal document that can be subpoenaed by legal resources and in fact has happened to me several times in my career as an educator, okay? So if our deal, if Aspire's deal and unique experience is that we're offering live, sustained, interactive instruction and we take attendance, that now has to, that is now a legal document. Okay, and you can think of all the reasons why that may or may not be a legal document. I had a, a family, not, not at Aspire, this was probably 12 years ago, that was trying to decide how to divide custody, right? And the mom was saying, oh, every time they're with dad, they're not to school on time, and, and the lawyer said, well, we need your records to show, and sure enough, Miki, I mean, I shiver when I think about it, if I just decided not to take... <laughs> careful records. No, it showed that every time that this kid was with one parent, they weren't coming to school late. That served as a really powerful legal document. So maybe more information than you needed, but because we are 
a live school, and because we take attendance, that does turn into something that's a big deal. So if you know you're gonna be gone, if your kids have to go to an appointment or something like that, please communicate to that. We have lots of reasons why we can um, excuse things. And by the way, even unexcused absences that we know about. So like, oh, I have to take and we're going on a family vacation early. Are those unexcused absences? I know you don't wanna say yes, but they are, okay? If you communicate with us, is it still an unexcused absence? Yes, but is it, is it building up to some dam breaking and you going, you know, having truancy issues? No, it's not, because you've communicated that with us. Yeah, you have a question, brother? Great question. I was, that's a fantastic question. You need to communicate um, issues of students being gone directly to the teachers who will then communicate with me. And the reason that's a smart first line of communication is because that's immediately where it may impact your child's work. So you need to let them know first and then the impetus of communicating that will be with me. But the teachers will all be also taking attendance as well. Good question, thank you. All right, so I just wanted to share that with you. Not as a threat because it's, you know, nothing negative, by the way, happened with those, with those communications that went out. It was just like, oh, you're, this is real. Yeah, we're a real school. <laughs> yeah. Um, interestingly, all of those situations improved immediately, and guess, and guess who benefited the most from it? The student did. And again, from, from our world, what's our number one objective? You have, you have, you have, several things that you're worried about, all of which have merit within your world. Just understand that as an organization, our objective is to care for your children in helping them learn. So those are the things we're pursuing. Okay. Are there any questions that you guys have right now? Because it's 11 and I wanted you guys to have the opportunity to discuss some things with me. And I will know that some of you will have some questions that will answer other people's questions as we go through here. Jen, go ahead. All the, su the supply list, if you go to AspireSDA.com, I always feel like anytime I start a website, it's like an advertisement. <clears throat> if you go to AspireSDA.com and hit the About page, and you scroll down to the teachers, all of the teachers in orange have a supply list underneath their names. You're welcome. Yeah. Sure. So this is a dynamic that is true across, and the spectrum is huge. All the things, all the reasons why your internet might go out. Why weather impacts it, I don't know, but it is a thing. Like we have high speed cable internet and when it rains it gets slow. Uh, one of my buddies said there's probably moisture in the line. I just have to trust that that's, that he's not making that up. It is amazing, what's, he's not making that up, okay, good. <laughs> It's, it is amazing how there are experts in certain fields, and they could literally say anything, and I'd be like, yeah, cool, sounds good. Yeah, well, there's a rotary girder stuck on the underside of the uh, gas gasket. Cool, awesome. Yeah, yeah, if you have, surprisingly, if you have mobile hotspots, you can make that work, and in instances like that, we usually say, like on a phone, we usually let kids not have their their cameras on for that because it streams way less data on your hotspot. We'd prefer them to at least be connected. That's not a fix all because not everyone can grab their phone and create a hotspot. Um, you may not have the technology on your phone, you may not have the coverage, but for most people if you have like 5G, if you ever run like an internet download and upload speed on 5G, generally speaking it's faster than most internet coming into your home across America right now. Yeah, do you have another question? Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Of course, yeah. These are great questions. These are the types of things we can't we can't prepare for all the little nuances in between along this line. 
you just need to, if you have still the ability to communicate what's going on, I mean, that happened all the time last year. We had 50 kids. We have 100 kids this year. It's going to happen again. You know, it's more of like, hey, this is why we're not in school. And we try to work with kids so they can get caught back up. The issue then, the issue really happens is this. If you're in school for two weeks and you're, or let's say in a two-week period, your internet is out 90% of the time, the question is, how do we punish you? For, not how do we punish you for that, right? Like, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, the, the, the practical reality is, is this a sustainable model to provide an education for your kids? And the answer to that is no. So then we have a conversation about that. But, but kids get dropped all the time. They come back in, and we work with them. It, but it's that sustained absence that, of it not working that really becomes a problem. Sure. We had parents do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Totally. 100%. Good question. Renee. Perfect, yeah. It's just not, yeah, there's no guarantee. I have great, I have, we're blessed where I live to have, you know, high-speed cable. But still, yeah. All right, any other questions? Because I do want to address, just go ahead and finish, Renee, then. Back to you. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So part of, what they're at, part of what our high school teachers are doing right now is empowering your kids to have a conversation about the things that they'd like to, to take. So you'll, you'll see that Aspires are growing in the world of high school, right? We're growing our program. We're not at a place where we have a, a massive number of faculty, especially faculty that are teaching um, options for electives, okay? So generally speaking, we have a pretty fixed schedule, but our electives right now, there's an elective period that I think is um, nutritional science or Spanish, okay? And then there's one at the end of the day, which I think is um, coding or yearbook, okay? So we're allowing them to engage right now with a conversation. I'll have a spreadsheet, and then what I think you're gonna have to do is see how your feelings about what they should be taking line up, okay? Your kids need to have five electives when they graduate from high school, five credits, okay? Five credits, which is a total of typically 10 elective courses, okay? Because most electives are half of a credit over the course of, or over the course of a, either a year, like we're doing, or over the course of a, of a term. Um, two of those credits, have to be in the areas of core content area, like math or science or English language arts, okay? So they could take, for example, yearbook would be an elective, but it would be an ELA elective. So that would count, if they took that, it would be a count of, a pound, <laughs> would count as what, uh, going towards their core elective requirement. So just bear that in mind. I love when someone asks a question that segues into the next thing I was going to mention. <clears throat> so the cameras that your Chromebooks come with are sufficient to do the work that they're required to do, okay? If they have a different camera that's set in a different location that's higher quality, that can be very beneficial, okay? It will work with any USB camera. The Chromebook will easily allow you to select which camera you want to be used. Some of our kids even had a separate microphone to work. They had their own setup. I will tell you a piece that is not required, but is incredibly helpful. And I'm looking at families in here that have done this and have talked to me about the positive impact. If you have an extra flat panel, 
computer screen in your house, or if you're in a position to get one, that is hugely helpful. Yeah, so um, I, uh, Mr. Coles, Matt, actually has a list of extra recommendations that we're going to send out to parents. So not required, but could be beneficial if you're in a position to do that. It's not, you won't have, you don't have to do it, okay? But understand the benefit of if you have a screen where you can have your meeting and then one where you're working, that may help the flow of things. I would say 90% of our students don't have that and they do perfectly fine. So the success of the program is not predicated on you ha doing that, but if they wanna have a secondary camera or another monitor, those are things that you certainly can do that will work with the device your students will have. Question? I have some things that I definitely wanna talk about as we wrap up at 11, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So you're saying, can you can you join in your Chromebook and then also work on your your screen like a PC? You you could do that. One of the things that will happen if you do that is there are software that monitors what students are doing and can limit what they're doing in terms of shutting down tabs, locking the screen, blocking stuff. Doesn't integrate with a PC that they're on. Another big consideration also is that on their Chromebooks, their teachers have accessed and will see all of their screens. They can click on their screens, they can open things on their screens, they can draw on their screens if during instruction time, each individually, not everyone's, but just individually on their screen to answer questions. That integration software doesn't work on a PC too. So if they have a question, hey, what, what do I do right here? And you, I can't see it. So if it was an extended desktop, obviously that would work, but if it were on a separate computer, just understand that that would be, of those oversight issues, wouldn't be there. We wouldn't be able to block what they're doing. So, which is a big piece. Yeah, could be, could be a valuable asset, not required for the program to work. I wanna be clear on that. I don't wanna even feel like I'm, did a bait and switch, like, yeah, we'll give you a Chromebook, but you're required to buy a $200 monitor. No, you aren't. Yeah, Mindy. Yes. Yeah. They are touch screen, yes. And they come with a stylus, too. Some of them have an active stylus, which comes with it. We'll only work with that stylus. Other will work with any stylus. But I think they're, they're getting all the information over there. All right. This may spur on some questions, but let me just share with you a little bit what we've been going through over this summer, and some of you have felt it more acutely than others, and I wanna walk a fine line here in summation here and as we wrap this conversation up. <clears throat> the financial aspect of what Aspire is doing is very important for the vitality of our program. The Aspire Academy is a conference school so what that means is the, the pattern typically in the Seventh-day Adventist education goes like this. A local constituent church runs an elementary school and subsidizes the school. Now this is a little lesson here. Take it or leave it. That's typically what happens. And then the conference comes in behind and subsidizes things like the benefits for the full-time employees and still the operating budget of the school in hidden, some of the hidden ways, right? So you have a constituent church, and then you have support from the conference, okay? We are a conference school, and the conference is both the constituent church and still just the conference, right? <laughs> and so we have a budget that allows us to function, but a lot of it, praise God, is based on the financial contributions and support of parents who are being diligent about participating in their obligation to support Seventh-day Adventist education through timely <laughs> and consistent returning of tuition dollars to the school. Despite the importance of everything that I've just said, um, we are still navigating through some challenges with our billing. 
um, through Jupiter Ed. But first, because I don't want to forget this, all of the really big important communications about the financial status of your account, your students' grades, a lot of important communication coming in through the teachers will come to you through Jupiter Ed. So if you see something from Jupiter in your mailbox, it is not coming to you from outer space. It is coming to you probably from me, our business manager, or, your, or the teacher of your children, okay? If you're not getting those, you need to check your spam ma mailboxes, as this happened to some people, and make sure that you are allowing messages from Jupiter Ed to come through. These are really, really important pieces of information. The other thing is that many times in these messages at the beginning, you'll be getting a little button that asks you to log in and create an account to see your students' grades. Man, I don't like that. They really emphasize, check your students' grades. Well, you have to actually go through that process of signing in to check your students' grades in order to check the balance you have on your bill. Okay, so that's actually the same login process. Okay. I'm going to send that email out again to everyone, and it will say, click here to check your students, to make an account to see your students' grades. But when you log in, after you create the account to see your students' grades, which you will want to see at some point, up in the upper left-hand corner of that screen, there's a, we call it a, a sandwich emblem, or a veggie burger emblem. <laughs> It's like, or a pancake emblem, it's these three lines that are stacked in the upper left-hand corner when you land after you log in. If you hit that, it will have a drop-down of all the different things you can look at associated with your student, their grades, all that kind of stuff, but one of those is where you click to see your bill, okay? We are still in the process of making sure that those bills reflect a handful of things. First of all, any support that you're getting from the school being reflected on there. So if you got a letter about support, or if we talked to you about um, uh, a local Aspire Academy worthy student support, that has to be reflected. That, for, for several of you, it was already reflected, for some it isn't. Um, local support coming in from your church will be reflected there, okay? Subsidy as a conference employee will be reflected there. But until, until all of those things are accurately reflected on that bill, and maybe I can get some feedback from you, I think essentially the position you are in is to pay what it says you owe, even if it's wrong, or to pay nothing. Like, you can't adjust. Like, let's work through a scenario. Let's say tuition is $100 a month. You have your, your church giving 50, and so that means you're left with $50 to pay. So if you log in and you want to pay your $50, but it says you owe 100 because the money isn't reflected from your church there, then I don't think you can select to pay just 50. You just have to pay what you're billed. Because of that, you were able to select This is beautiful. So, no, don't apologize. Okay. That's that's what I thought. Yeah. We okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a typical AR software. You can pay, they'll take more from you, but they won't take less than what you said to do. So here's the here's the challenge. First of all, I want to apologize about this. Um, we have had a very busy and dedicated um, treasurer this year who, who's working, who just finished two weeks of an entire conference-wide audit. If you had the privilege to interact with or chat with Tom, he's a wonderful gentleman and a very kind individual who has been engrossed in work in his field of study, <laughs> field of study, in his, in his, in his field. Um, and uh, God bless the whole situation. That aspect of what Aspire needed, uh, just practically speaking, was not, was not addressed in a way that we needed it to happen. I'm telling you this because there is a, a donation link. It's called a donation link. 
that I can send out to you, and it literally says, donation link, parentheses, not a donation. <laughs> so our software allows us, to, or through Jupyter, allows us to produce a link <laughs> to take donations, and that link you can put any amount in that you want, okay? So if you are feeling anxious about wanting to pay the portion that you know you are supposed to be paying forward, but you can't pay it because it's not accurately reflected, check from Jupiter. I'm gonna send out a link to you so that you can take care of that and have you know, that resolved, okay? We hope to have all of this resolved by the middle of the, the month and have proper and accurate accounting and information going out. But um, without oversharing and certainly without indicating any level of, of frustration or, or a lack of, uh, of gratitude for the help that we've gotten, we, you know, we went from 18 students our first year to 56 kids the second year to 100 kids this year. And Praise God for that, first of all. We're very grateful for God's <laughs> guidance in that process. But in the world of um, just speaking honestly here, in the world of Adventist education right now, that is a unique, that's a unique pro uh, progression. And there's not a playbook, <laughs> there's not a playbook to know how to accommodate and support that type of that type of growth. So the issue of the money issue is a, is a very personal issue, and if that has been a source of frustration for you, please accept my apology. Understand that that also has been a source of frustration for me. But as we move forward, especially coming in here to the, this next part of the month, we, we, plan on getting, we plan on getting those accounts resolved and updated and making sure that each month is reflecting an accurate number that, uh, that you're moving forward with. If you have questions related to that that are more personal, uh, please, please chat with me, okay? I will have a spreadsheet open, and I'll be taking some notes, and making sure we can get that, that squared away, okay? And again, the, the, um, the donation thing may be a good stopgap solution. Because what you don't want to, obviously what I know you don't want to do, right, is get to October and have registration and three months of tuition due. So, anyway. Well, Rilton, Renee, one, one quick question. April and then Renee. Yes, yeah, Attention Inspire Academy. Yep, yep. That, that will all be reflected in Jupyter, yeah. It's all in our point of sale software for, through Stripe, so, but that has to be transferred from Stripe over into Jupyter. Yeah, because some of you went through our payment portal and made payments on our website but that wasn't connected to Jupiter. That had to be manually transferred over, which, not, which would not have been a big deal if we had someone dedicated to doing that. Anyway, uh, Renee and then Mandy. Yes, I can, I can take care of that too. I, that's a great question. Please don't do that until I can tell you whether or not that works or not. I, I would assume if it goes to the conference, it, it would work, but there may be someone, there may be someone. Uh, that would typically be dealt with by your treasurer at the local church level, but be, yeah, we do. Good question, let me follow up with you again on that. Okay. Yeah, we're just functioning on a conference level. So if you're, Doing that through your local church, it would depend on how the conference would want to deal with your local treasurer and getting that money. But I, I feel that that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, so I don't want to give any final. Oh, okay. So you're not talking about the Adventist pay. Okay, gotcha. 
Yeah, Shelley. You would still, uh, no, you would apply it through Aspire. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have to check and see if it's still open or not. If it's, I mean, I think you can still, I, anyone can still apply, I think. I'm not the, luckily, I don't, I, don't, I don't have the, luckily, I'm not the person who makes that call by myself. But if you can go and click, if it's accessible, then yes. All right, it's, it's after 11, isn't it? It's still before when your kids are gonna be out, though. All right, guys, thank you. Um, moving forward, just to put this in your, um, kind of put this on your radar, starting in April, we're gonna start communicating with you about your plans for the 23-24 school year and worrying about the registration process then. Um, but I just appreciate everyone's I mean, m most people are, are okay with us, uh, with giving you a little more time to pay. <laughs> it's a little, it's not quite the same as us barking down your, uh, uh, barking at your door about it, but goodness. It's been, it's been a challenge and I just appreciate your understanding of the situation, but um, we'll have it resolved. And in the interim, I will email out that, that link for the donation, parentheses, not a donation. <clears throat> which when I told our business manager about it, he's like, oh no, don't do that because it says donation. I said, what if I call it donation then put not a donation in? He's like, I guess that works. <laughs> no, your, your email address and your information is in there so we'll know how to get it correlated. So if that's something you're interested in doing, we can work with you because I know some of you are anxious about saying like, do I just put this in a cookie jar and wait until I can give it to you? That's always, that's annoying when someone wants to give you money but you can't take it from them. That's like like a bad problem to have. So I'm trying to get through that. I'm trying to get through it. I uh, appreciate all you guys. Um, never hesitate to reach out and let me know how uh, we can serve your family. In any way, we're happy to, to consider that and um, we're so glad and so blessed that you're part of, of Spire Academy. It really means a lot to us. Let me finish with a word of prayer, and then if you have questions for me, I'll be happy to, to chat with you guys. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us, for all you do, for us constantly, Lord, to sustain us and to bring us joy and happiness and fulfillment. We credit all of the good things in our lives to you, Lord. Um, just continue to bless us as we're here. Uh, bless our, our students in the other room as they work through the, excited, the excitement of getting their devices set up and ready to go, Lord bugs that may exist there. I pray that you would uh, remove them. <laughs> Lord, just continue to keep us safe and healthy here for the next uh, couple days. And in all we do, Lord, we want to bring you honor and praise. To that end, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen.